Hi, and welcome to The Horn, a podcast from International Crisis Group. I'm Alan Boswell. In mid-October, President Trump announced that the U.S. government would be lifting its 27-year-old sanctions on Sudan as a designated state sponsor of terror. Today on the podcast, we have Jonas Horner, Crisis Group's senior analyst on Sudan, as well as Deputy Horn of Africa director. He's just back from Khartoum and here to talk to us about where Sudan is at a year and a half after the ouster of President Omar al-Bashir. Jonas, welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Alan. Thanks for having me. So, Jonas, you just returned from a few weeks in Khartoum. Um, I'm wondering, what's the state of the transition now on the ground? Well, um, it's not good. You know, there's, you can't make a mistake about that. You know, the transition is in deep trouble. Uh, and this is particularly because the economy really drags everything down. You, you really, as you move around Khartoum in particular, uh, people are quite frustrated about uh, having to stay in long queues for fuel and, and, and for bread. And uh, and the general uh, economic malaise really does uh, do irreversible damage to the civilian government. And and I think uh, it, it damages also the civilians as as a a potential governing dispensation in the future. People are frustrated, and a lot of that came out in recent protests uh, about a week ago. The Prime Minister, uh, Abdullah Hamadok, continues to be very timid in spending the political capital he, he has. That has been, that political capital has been waning for some time now. And uh, on top of it, the forces for freedom and change, who really were um, uh, meant to be the stewards for the, for the revolution and for civilians generally, really ha- haven't been good stewards um, f- for all of the instincts of Sudan's revolution. There have been a couple of achievements, though, in recent times, the first being the signing of the Juba agreement uh, between uh, most of Sudan's armed groups and the transitional government. And then perhaps even more recently, and with greater fanfare, the promise from the U.S. administration to remove Sudan from its state sponsor of terrorism list. Neither have really changed the tone, though, it, it must be said, um, and the economy really remains uppermost in, in, in people's minds. So the big news is, of course, the announcement from President Trump that he will delist Sudan from the state sponsor of terror designation. That's after 27 years uh, since the Clinton administration first imposed those sanctions. Uh, We've, of course, talked about it at length on this podcast. It's something the Sunnis people have been waiting for for a very long time. Now that that's happened, now what? When can we expect to see any changes? Well, all the way from, from, you know, the transitional government and prime minister's office down to people, you know, on the street who, who are moving about their daily lives. There, there is real interest in uh, this state sponsor of terrorism, SST issue. Um, and there has also been a belief, um, from, from top to bottom in Sudanese society of a fairly immediate economic bounce and the evidence from for example, the 2017 removal of U.S. sanctions on Sudan, you know, suggests that 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 is uh, unlikely to to, to occur. Uh, first of all, um, there is a, still a technical process that the U.S. government has to go through, so uh, rescission has not uh, rescission of SST has not happened yet. But um, you know, this the advantages of SST on the economic side will only be apparent in the medium to, to longer terms. Immediately, though, this really should be a win politically for Prime Minister Hamadok, who, who really needs it. Uh, and uh, I'm a little surprised that he has not been more, um, you know, uh, vociferous in, in taking some credit for this. You know, after all, he, you know, a key component uh, and selling point for him as he came in as, as the Forces for Freedom and Change a candidate for Prime Minister was that he would be able to mobilize economic assistance and to engage more robustly with the international community. In the medium to longer term, those those economic benefits could be really the uh, removal of significant barriers to to critical banking relationships. It uh, eases investors' concerns about reputational risk in Sudan, uh, and also allows the U.S. to support debt relief for Sudan at um, the the key international financial institutions. Um, and and I think there's also a uh, you know a real bounce for Sudan as it uh, takes itself out of this list of um, of pariah states, the, the other denizens of the SST list are Iran, Syria, and uh, the, and North Korea. So uh, Sudan clearly doesn't belong on that list. And so from that perspective alone, uh, this does give real bounce uh, to Sudan at, uh, for its role in the international community. And, you know, this this SST designation has often been been held up as the thing that's holding, you know, the international community from, from offering more financial support, uh, more of a lifeline to the new government in Sudan, 
Is there anything lined up that would come to Sudan now that this has been lifted? Do we have any idea on sort of numbers and timelines on when help would be on the way? Well, the U.S. has suggested that it is lining up a much larger package of aid, um, and and perhaps you know uh, perhaps more immediately though, uh, as I was able to speak to uh, the French uh, government uh, e- earlier in the year, they have said that they were waiting for the lift of the SST uh, designation to uh, forgive six billion dollars of Sudan's debt to to France, all of it, and the U.S. has also indicated a will to cancel a Sudanese debt. Uh, this also precipitated states some aid um, through a new bill that, that is being introduced within in Washington. Uh, and so, you know, I think this opens up a lot of space for foreign direct investment. You know, people are going to feel more, investors are going to feel more able and more comfortable with dealing with Sudan. So one of the demands from the Trump administration, um, and it, it looked a bit like a quid pro quo, um, was that Sudan had to normalize ties with, with Israel in order to get this delisting from, from these sanctions. How does this play politically inside Sudan? Well, this has really uh, occupied a, a lot of news space, and, uh, and, and with good reason, I think. The economic concerns for Sunnis remain paramount, and I think you know, st- still occupy main, the main area uh, of concern for Sudanese. And if state sponsor of terrorism rescission can deliver an economic bounce uh, in good time, then I think the uh, quid pro quo, as you say, with Israel uh, in, in exchange for, for normalization of relations with Israel will seem like a good deal uh, for, for, for Sudanese. The concern, though, is that because Sudanese are already in a very, you know, uh, worried and, and, and concerned and frustrated state because of the state of the economy, um, that uh, that the normalization with Israel perhaps c- could be uh, harmed as a new issue uh, to beat the government with, uh, and, and it could be a point of mobilization, especially amongst uh, Islamist groups and uh, groups who are associated with the former regime. And between those two, there is plenty of uh, of overlap. I do, you know, as I said, I do think that there is a missed opportunity here for Prime Minister Hamadok. He, he had hung his name um, and his reputation in many ways on being able to bring Sudan off of the list. And he has uh, not yet taken a a victory lap. And I think in many ways, this is because the Sudanese government and and Sudanese generally remain very circumspect uh, about this eventually happening. There is still a a technical process in Washington that has to happen. And Sudanese remain very, you know, perhaps they've been burned by by previous attempts to come off the list. um, And they have seen the goalposts move in the past. And so as a result, there's a lot of wariness in Khartoum about this. And we've touched on this um, already, but I'm just wondering, you were just there and you mentioned, you know, as we've mentioned many times in this podcast, how Sudan's economy is in such dire straits. I mean, what did you see while you were there to just give an example of, you know, what the Sudanese are facing right now? Sure. It's, it's been quite stark. You know, I've been working in Sudan for a decade now and, and really, you know, the, the differences are, are, are clear. You know, first of all, the exchange rate for the U.S. dollar is 100 times it was when I arrived in the middle of, of 2010. Uh, and, and it's spiraling, uh, you know, into, into, into worse territory as we, as we stand. And, you know, many uh, key businesses, big businesses, um, have ceased production because it simply has ceased to become worth it to produce uh, some of their products. And many stores uh, have taken products off the shelves because their value gets eaten up uh, so quickly. Sudan's inflation is second only to that of Venezuela. The, the other really obvious signs as you move around Khartoum in particular are fuel lines um, of cars, of uh, of motorbikes, of uh, tuk-tuks that run for kilometers and are not just single file. They are often three or four abreast. Those cars are just standing there and they wait and they wait at night and they wait in the day. Uh, and you will also see people bringing mattresses to bakeries because they know that they are going to be sleeping out rough, uh, waiting for uh, you know the, the next delivery of bread because uh, it is that scarce. And of course, our concern at Crisis Group all along has been that with the lifting of the SST, that the U.S. you know was moving far too slow, and that when it does come, it might be too little, too late. The other big news recently is the Juba peace deal, of course, as you mentioned. Uh, what exactly did Sudan agree to with these armed groups? Many of which, of course, haven't actually fought inside Sudan in a long while. Well, uh, you know, key here um, in the peace deal is really that this is a, a quite profound devolution of power and, and wealth outwards, if indeed the agreement is, is implemented as, as written. 
uh, it really does attempt, at least, to address the root causes of conflict in Sudan, um, you know, with in, including ins- assurances that regions can uh, keep the profits from fr- from from the states and, and regions in which those profits are are derived. The format that the negotiations and agreement took, which is to take regional tracks. Um, there were five. There was one from each of the compass points and then the center. Um, but, but this has led to a situation in which uh, Darfurian groups, who, who, who made up the preponderance of, of negotiators and really had, had brought the most to the table, they have come away with the best deal, I would suggest. Uh, and, and there was a lot of uh, discord even within those, those signatories uh, about the way that the Darfuris have come to, to dominate this, this this deal. The deal also sets up many committees and bodies to address very specific issues such as, you know, return of IDPs and refugees and, and the always uh, tricky issue of land. The, the other components include uh, security sector reform, which includes integration of the armed groups into the Sudan Armed Forces and Rapid Support Forces, uh, and disarmament, demobilization, and reintegration, DDR, for those who uh, uh, cannot be, be integrated. But uh, there are positions in government reserved at varying percentage levels for the signatories. Um, and I think, you know, key here is that, as, as you say, the main groups do remain outside. Those The two groups who really carry genuine constituencies and who uh, carry the most in the way of military capacity. That's uh, the Sudan Liberation Army of Abdul Wahid al Nur, who was based in Darfur, and then the Sudan People's um, Liberation Army north of Abdulaziz al Hilu. Both of those gentlemen uh, have so far remained outside of the agreement, although uh, Abdulaziz uh, has been negotiating much more actively with the government and is now in Juba uh, trying to um, see if he can find a way to uh, into the deal. So even though those two big rebel groups, um, Abdel Wahid and Abdel Aziz, didn't sign this peace deal, the scope of the signed uh, text is actually still quite ambitious. So it, does this just come down to a question of whether and how they implement it? Yes, the devil will definitely be be in the implementation. The finance minister, the acting finance minister, had already put a seven and a half billion dollar price tag on uh, on the peace deal uh, that comes out to about seven point five billion and. Sudan is broke. They're, they're, they do not have the money f- to, to deliver that. And so they will be relying heavily, if not entirely, on the international community to fund what is, in fact, a very heavy deal. Part of the problem here is that the international community was largely absent in Juba. There were some uh, technical, uh, there was some technical presence, it's true, from the UK and, and the US. But on the whole, there was no consultation with the international community. And I think as such, what happened was that there were unrealistic expectations about just how uh, enthused and uh, the international community would be about this and also mis- misperceptions about just how deep uh, the international community's pockets are in this day of uh, COVID, of low oil prices uh, and and uh, increasing sort of I- insularity. So, of course, the overall context of this is the power sharing arrangement between the military and the civilians after Bashir fell out of power. Is it clear yet how this new peace deal with these armed groups, uh, you know, which side of that ledger uh, it will end up weighing in on? Well, signature of the Juba agreement does change the entire dynamic uh, by bringing the SRF into government. But more importantly, it does adjust the balance of power in in the transitional government. You know, I, I fear, though, this is not necessarily for the better because it really appears to have empowered the military side of the equation in the transitional government. The FFC's key place in government provided by their signature with the Transitional Military Council of the Constitutional Declaration, which really established this transitional period, is diluted by the entry of the SRF into all elements of the transitional government. You know, that's the Council of Ministers, that is the Sovereign Council, and also the yet-to-be-formed uh, Transitional Legislative Council. But it really didn't have to be this way, uh, unfortunately. Um, the FFC should have shown more flexibility in coming to an accord that brought the SRF, um, it should have shown more flexibility in coming to an accord that brought the SRF, uh, into the constitutional declaration. And, uh, and it would have bound the two blocks together. And, and they had these talks in July of 2019, but the FFC opted to go it alone and, and felt that it could go it alone. And so they alone signed the constitutional declaration with the Transitional Military Council. And this, of course, put the SRF in a position to forum shop. They, they still wanted to, of course, be part of the transition. Um, and, you know, and they found uh, South Sudan ready and, and willing to host and, and also the Emiratis ready and willing uh, and able to, to, to pay for that forum. 
But what has happened is that the uh, centrality of the military to the transition has been reinforced because they are now the prominent parties, both uh, as uh, co-signatory of the Constitutional Declaration, and you know now because they dominated the talks at Juba, uh, they are the ones who are seen to have, in fact, struck this deal with the SRF. The, the civilians were, in large part, uh, you know, very much underrepresented at at Juba. The FFC, who are on paper the executors of the revolution's values and political strength were badly sidelined in Juba. So they really did not get to have uh, as much influence as they really should have over the Juba agreement. And, and now they find themselves, as I said, diluted in, in the transitional government. My concern, though, was that Juba provided a forum for the SRF and the RSF in particular, uh, uh, who have Darfuri roots, despite their heavy recent recruitment across Sudan. But it, it, it provided a forum for those two to find common cause as fighters for the margin, seeking to redress the stark imbalances of, of post-independent Sudan. And... You know, it, it is really incumbent, perhaps, upon the international community as a convener to bring the FFC and the SRF back closer together so that they collectively can do better at being representatives of uh, the revolution and, and civilians more broadly uh, in, in this transitional government. Uh, so, so, so in other words, what you're saying is that the answer might not be really neither the civilian political forces nor the old guard military, but rather this this seems to maybe be lining up in, in General Hameti's uh, interest and, and possibly a center periphery realignment. That is my core concern about how this is how this is playing out. Um, I, in many ways, this is simply because nobody really has taken a hold of this transitional process in general. And General Hameti does seem like the only one who really um, has some direction and, and strategic approach to to moving this transition ahead. So we've also had a lot of unrest recently in eastern Sudan, which which wasn't, you know, hasn't been seen in recent years and, and decades as sort of the, the main restive area uh, in Sudan. But we've seen, as I said, a lot of unrest there um, on the heels of this bigger peace deal. Uh, what's going on over there and, and how does how does that fit into this wider picture? Yes, the, the East you know, really is the, the emerging concern for crisis group. You know, we judge in some ways that the East is rather a potentially greater tin, tinderbox than Darfur currently. And uh, and this is seen you know, as you move around uh, Kassala and Port Sudan in the East. People feel very unsafe as they move around the streets. They are find themselves hurrying home uh, after their work. Uh, the markets are much more empty and there is just a general sense of, of worry and, and insecurity that pervades the, the key towns and cities uh, in the East. Initially, a lot of this, uh, the, the violence that, that will have started people's attention uh, to, to the East started with clashes between uh, Nuba and Beni Amr. Um, but, but this has also uh, now encompassed related concerns in the East that, uh, that, that have been raised by uh, Bija groups um, who felt that they were not accurately represented at the table uh, in Juba when the Ajuba agreement was being negotiated. And, and so these Bija groups have sought to bring pressure to bear on the government to be included. They held a, a conference in Sinkat in Red Sea State, uh, you know, about a month ago and called for self-determination at that point and, and had blocked off the roads to Sudan's all-important lifeline of, of of Port Sudan. Further, you know, into this and and and, and integral to to that, um, you know, that, that renewed tri- intertribal uh, discord really was the attempt to uh, to seat uh, and then the firing subsequently of the Kassala governor, governor Saleh Amar, um, who is himself a Beni Amr, but he was appointed in August and never made it out to Kassala at all. Such was the intensity of the protests against him. And so ultimately, he was sacked earlier this month without ever having gone out to Kassala. The only other point here I, I really think that is, is is really worth saying about the East is that really this now increasingly encompasses uh, a, a regional dynamic. And, and that particularly brings concerns that are emanating from Tigray and are a byproduct of Tigray's own competition with, with Addis Ababa. You know, there are signs of you know, proxy, uh, a proxy war, you know, between TPLF and, and Eritrea. Uh, and, and this is very much a subset of our grave concerns about stability in Ethiopia, as much a subset of, about our grave concerns about Sudanese stability. Yeah, and that's a that's a great segue into some more regional and and bigger picture questions dealing with this transition in Sudan. You know, one of the features of this transition has been the Sudanese revolution 
uh, from the beginning uh, was, of course, you know, an incredible show of force from the Sudanese people. And then you have all these outside players who who, who got involved. You know, the, the main backers of the military side, uh, some have, have dubbed the Arab Troika, that's Saudi Arabia, the UAE, Egypt. The civilian side is, is seen as being backed often by, by Western powers. Now now that we're like more than a year into this power sharing arrangement, um, is, is that basic breakdown uh, still holding true or is that a bit too reductive? That does still hold true, and 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 I'm I'm sad to see that because we you know there is a real need for for I think um, a more productive role for Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates in in Sudan. There really is a diversity of concepts of just what transition in Sudan means across many of the actors who, who, who stakeholders who, who are, uh, you know, see, seen to be active in Sudan. And many of these are, are mutually exclusive. And, and I think that's, that's really the problem of the international community getting onto a single page and then push, pushing in a cohesive way, uh, for, for Sudan to advance its, its transition. For, for, for Saudi Arabia and, and the UAE, you know, the preference has clearly been for, for the military. Um, and, and certainly that, that means that they have not favored the civilian side of, of the equation. You know, the entire amount of, um, $750 million of the promised $3 billion that the, that the Saudis and Emiratis promised during the revolution, um, was only disbursed during the time that the military was in control. That is before uh, August when the uh, forces for freedom and change signed uh, the constitutional declaration with the transitional military council. You know, the, the further evidence of this is that, you know, in the last year or so, uh, before Bashir had left, there were billions of dollars that were channeled, uh, into Sudan's central bank uh, to support Bashir. And yet very little support, uh, has really found its way to back the civilian dispensation, um, uh, the, the civilian led government, uh, in Khartoum. There's also some divergence here between, um, you know, uh, Saudi Arabia and Egypt, which tend to support the Sudan armed forces because of abiding uh, past relationships um, w- with with SAF. And, and you also see the Emirates standing much more readily behind the rapid support forces of, of General Hemeti. Um, if you speak with rapid support forces and Sudan armed forces, however, they will both rigidly insist that they are a single entity. But um, if you dig a little deeper, there are some quite um, problematic divisions between those two components of Sudan's military that um, are are calls for their own concern over domestic stability. So in summary, it's, you know, it's been almost uh, a year and a half since the Sunnis people um, took Omar al-Bashir out of power. Is it clear yet exactly where Sudan is heading, what this new political dispensation in Sudan, you know, really looks like? What a post-Bashir Sudan looks like? Well, no, I think it's not yet clear what post-Bashir Sudan looks like. And I think that's in part because nobody internationally or domestically has been able to get a hold of the transition to sort of push it or pull it in a particular direction. So the net effect there is that Many of the parties uh, who have interest in, in, in the direction of the transition are, are hedging. So people, you know, different stakeholders and parties are all, uh, existing in orbit while without ever really landing th- their interests and, and bringing them to bear on the transition uh, and therefore pushing that transition in, in the particular direction. At the central of this really is the question of the economy. We certainly see the economy as the core political risk uh, for Sudan and, and for the transition more, more broadly. And, and without really expeditious intervention internationally and reforms domestically, you know, th- this is the kind of, of issue that can sink the transition. In part, this is also because the civilians' ability to illustrate to Sudanese that they are, in fact, the sort of dispensation that can adequately respond to Sudanese needs that have been expressed during the, the revolution, freedom, peace, and justice, a civilian government's ability to respond to those uh, th- those calls really is wrapped up in their ability to get, get a hold of the economy so that it can, in fact, show that it can deliver for Sudanese. Similarly, the clinching of the Juba Agreement on, on 3rd of October also provides some 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 changes you know not least of which is the emerging relationship between the SRF and the RSF that, that came out of that forum. Uh, and, and this is certainly a concern for a crisis group in the way that this perhaps tilts the balance of power within the transitional government, potentially away from the civilians who are primarily uh, represented by the Forces for Freedom and Change or, or FFC. But it also 
concerns those at the center, uh, the old guard um, and, and the riverine elite who have traditionally held power in Khartoum, because they see this SRF-RSF coalition as a coalition of the margins. And that represents a very fundamental uh, flip of the traditional power balance that has persisted in Sudan since independence. And the our concern really is of the reaction or, or backlash uh, to, to that emerging coalition of the margins um, but from those in the center who have a great deal to lose should uh, those from Darfur, from South Kordofan, from Blue Nile find common cause uh, across rebel and military lines and, and, and start to bring to bear the interests of, of the margins. Okay, and 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 finally, Jonas, uh, you know, moving aside from politics, I'm just curious, uh, what's the pandemic look like from Khartoum? It's quite striking. Uh, there is very little sign that COVID nineteen uh, is an issue or, or or a theme in Sudan. There had been a spike of cases and deaths in May and June, and that precipitated, uh, you know, uh, lockdowns to, to some degree, and, and and you know, people masking up and and being much more concerned about COVID nineteen. But since then, it has been very quiet. As you move around the streets in Khartoum, it's very um, noticeable when you see somebody moving around wearing a mask. And life really seems to be moving on as normal. Um, and, and this doesn't seem to be, um, you know, manifesting in, in, in a spike in cases per se either. But uh, the data also is, is, is very spotty. Interesting. Well, uh, thanks, Jonas, for, for coming on. And i um, glad you're, you're, you're back in Nairobi. Thanks, Alan. Thanks for having me. Thanks, as always, for listening to The Horn. To find out more about Crisis Group's work, visit our website at crisisgroup.org. You can also check out our new global podcast, co-hosted by Crisis Group's president, Rob Malley, Hold Your Fire. And we also have a podcast on Europe, War and Peace. Once again, I'm Alan Boswell. This podcast is produced by Mae Francis.